Our reading from the scriptures this evening comes from Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. We'll read the first 20 verses. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he bloweth the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his own iniquity, but his blood will I require at the hand of the watchman, at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, Thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. And this is what he is to say to them. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. For by, as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust in it to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Yet the people that the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you 
every man, every one after his ways. We stop in our reading of God's word there and pray his blessing of it to us. The reason for the selection of this passage of scripture is because in verse 6, God says to Ezekiel that he has a calling, a calling in the church that's similar to that of a physical watchman over the walls of, on the walls of a city. Watchman is called to alert the people to dangers. And when they do so, then they are performing their calling and duty. We use that figure that in, because we pick up that figure in Lord's Day 31 of the Heidelberg Catechism. This has to do with the keys, what's called the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Something that Jesus referenced in Matthew chapter 16. There Jesus was answering Peter, or asked Peter and the other disciples, whom do men say that I am? Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, namely the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah, God and man, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then he adds, it explains what that means, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's the figure. The reference to the keys is already found in answer 82 of the previous Lord's Day. By the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the sinner is led to show amendment of life. So that leads then to the question, what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Two, the preaching of the gospel and Christian discipline or excommunication out of the Christian church. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is opened to believers and shut against unbelievers. Now with regard to the preaching first and then the, sac the Christian discipline. How is the kingdom of heaven opened and shut by the preaching of the holy gospel? Thus, when according to the command of Christ, it is declared and publicly testified to all and every believer that whenever they receive the promise of the gospel by a true faith, that's what it is to believe, all their sins are really forgiven them of God for the sake of Christ's merits. And on the contrary, when it is declared and testified to all unbelievers, and such as do not sincerely repent. There's that word sincerely again. Remember we had that at the end of question, answer 81. We come to the table. Hypocrites may not come, but also those who do not turn to God with sincere hearts, lest they eat and drink judgment to themselves. So sincerely repent that they stand exposed to the wrath of God and eternal condemnation. As, so long as they are unconverted, according to which testimony of the gospel, God will judge them, both in this and in the life to come. So the preaching is the declaration of this promise upon repentance, forgiveness, and upon unrepentance, exposure to the wrath of God and eternal condemnation. 85. How is the kingdom of heaven shut and opened by Christian discipline? Thus, when according to the command of Christ, those who under the name of Christians maintain doctrines or practices inconsistent therewith and will not, after having been often brotherly admonished, renounce their errors and wicked course of life. 
they are complained of to the church or to those who are thereunto appointed by the church, and if they despise their admonition, are by them forbidden the use of the sacraments, whereby they are excluded from the Christian church and by God himself from the kingdom of Christ. And when they show promise, when they promise and show real amendment, are again received as members of Christ and his church. Keys of the kingdom. The faithful proclamation of the pure doctrines of the Holy Gospel and the faithful exercise of Christian discipline. Let's first look at the concept that's behind this, and that's rather easy for all of us to get because we've had that already dealt with in this passage from Ezekiel 33. Everybody, even the children, know what a key does. With a key, you can lock a door or you can unlock it. When you lock it, Yes, you can keep people out so they cannot come in. But you also keep in those that are in and belong in. So there's two effects on those on the outside and those on the inside when you lock it. When you unlock it, then positively you can receive repented sinners in. Not only initially, if they've never been in before, or as we just read, those who have been excluded but then show amendment of life, they can be received back. So you unlock it so that it's open for those to come in. But it's also open so that those who are in reveal themselves to be hypocrites, not real sheep, or it's set before them who are unrepentant that their unrepentance is going to be the reason and the cause for their to be brought out. So, lock, unlock, shut, to keep in, to keep out, to bring in, to let out. Ezekiel portrays the church as a city that needs watchmen because of an enemy that might come from without. No early warning systems. The only warning system was vision placed in a high tower, a high place, could see a great distance, good eyesight to be able to see an approaching enemy. Jesus, in that prayer that he prayed just before they walked in, and maybe even as they were walking into the Garden of Gethsemane, said this, I have given to those, Father, that thou hast given to me thy word. I have given them thy word. And then he adds, this is John 17, verse 14. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The world hateth them because they're not of the world. Just before Jesus began this prayer, the last verse of John 16, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Tribulation. The world's going to hate you. There are enemies, individuals, that God, I'm sorry, that 
God has the devil use, that God has the devil use to bring attacks against the church. Those can be in the form of false doctrine, heresy. They can be in the form of persecution of any kind, any level of persecution. They can be in the form of ridicule and mockery. The church must be on its guard against the enemies from without. The devil loves to allure. Sometimes he does it that way. He can do it with hatred, but Balaam was not dumb when he told Balak, send your handsome men and your cute daughters to Israel. Allure them, attract them. The watchmen that God sets on the walls of Zion have to be aware of every kind of attack that Satan will use to destroy the church of God in the world. But the attack of Satan is tricky, as deceptive, as lying as he is, is not only on the outside. There are also attacks and dangers from within. And yes, sadly, there are those that are raised within the sphere of the church that are Esau's. God always wants us to be aware that we are saved in our generations by grace and not we have to expect our children to believe. So God has there to be Esau's within the sphere of the church. The scriptures also speak of within the church there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Sometimes they're the hypocrites. Other times there are others that deceptively get in, act like they're right with us, but they have the appearance of sheep because they put on sheep wool over themselves, but they're really wolves within, and they can devour from within. But the biggest danger within, those are real dangers within, but the biggest danger within is our vicious, sinful natures. We always have to be taught. We always have to be caught. We always have to be admonished. Because the real life of a Christian what it means to be in the kingdom or in the church of God is not sinless ones, but rather the character of a Christian, as long as he's living in this world and in this life, is that he is repenting, 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 constant repentance. It's the impenitent, the ones not sorry, the ones making all kinds of excuses that have to be told, you're on your way out. You're bringing yourself out. The need for the watchman to be at work is to have us be taught through the gospel preaching. And this is the key of the preaching. It tells us that the repenting ones are the ones that are forgiven. Did you notice that as we, as we read it? They receive that whenever they receive the promise of the gospel by a true faith, all their sins are really forgiven them for the sake of Christ's merits. They hear that. You're forgiven. Well, who needs to be told that they're forgiven? The ones that are sinning, 
and acknowledging that they sin. Those are the ones that delight to hear, I'm, I'm still forgiven. I'm still forgiven. I'm still forgiven. So the watchmen have to be at work. We have to be told all the time. Ephesians 1 verse 4. How does that go? That according to his, according as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. His purpose of electing us is that we stand before him as holy ones, saints, saints. Because we made ourselves, no. Because we're justified in Christ. We're sinners. Always sinning. Forgiven by grace. Justified in Christ. By faith alone, without works. That's why the gospel, that's the heart of the content of the gospel preaching. So when the pure doctrines of the gospel are preached, that's what's set before the sinners. Sinners who are consistently showing the life of Christ by repenting, being sorry, asking for forgiveness, wanting to show gratitude for that forgiveness over and over and over and over as long as we live, every day, all day. So God says, I call certain ones to be watchmen. In the history of the church, there have been four ways in which the watchmen are established or appointed by the church. One is that which some of us have gained familiarity because of the, our commemoration of the Synod of Dort. At the time of the Synod of Dort, remember there was chairs in the middle. Remember the picture where the delegates sat and there were chairs in the middle. And the chairs in the middle were, were taken every, every session by the state's generals. They represented the state government. Because at the time of the Synod of Dort, the state ruled the church. The state called the preachers. The state paid the ministers and the delegates. The state ruled the church. That's called an Erastian church polity, state rule. The, other, the second kind of form of church government that we're more familiar with is what we observe in the Church of Rome, where it's called a hierarchical system of church polity. So there are priests, and there are bishops, and there are archbishops, and there's cardinals, and then there's the pope. But it all goes up, up to position of greatest power or lesser power but an authority but that's all hierarchy and they are the ones that they believe are the ones who rule the church on the other end of the extreme of these forms of government the third one we want to mention is that of congregationalism congregationalism says that the office of all believer is enough. That's the only office you really have to worry about. The office of all believer rules, and they have the right, each one of them, to make the judgments about the ruling and caring of the church. If they combine themselves together, it's the voice of the majority. That's congregationalism. The Reformed view of church polity is the declaration that, well, it's called Presbyterian church polity. 
And it's because the word presbyterian or presbuteros is the Greek word for elder, elder. There's a word presbuteros, elder, and there's a word that's translated bishop or overseer. Those are the two interchangeable words that the scriptures use to describe this, that Christ has established in the church elders, watchmen that he has to watch over the church. Acts 20. Paul is making his last third missionary journey. In verse 17, he sent to Miletus and called the elders of the church. And when he met with them, he said this to them in verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. He called the elders and he said to them, watch yourselves and all the flock, but God, through the Holy Spirit, has called you to oversee them. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, Acts, yeah, 20, 17 and 28. Hebrews 13 speaks of those overseers this way. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. There are those in the church that have the rule over the office of all believer. Submit yourselves, for they watch for their souls, not as self-appointed men, but this, as they which must give an account that they may get, do it with joy and not with grief. For if they give their accounting with grief, that is unprofitable for you. Those two passages, and a few others that we'll point out in a minute, are passages which the Reformed faith have established and declared, that's how we know that God would have his church be ruled by elders. Not the state, not a pope, not congregationalism, but by elders, the presbyters, the overseers. Not some elders more than other elders. All elders are equal in their authority. They may have varying gifts, but they're all equal in authority. Not one has more authority than the other. Not minister as a teaching elder has more authority than the other elders. And that's why a plurality was always appointed. Acts 14, when Paul and Barnabas were going back to the churches where they first brought the gospel of Jesus Christ, they appointed elders, plural, in every city, in every church. And then we see this. When for the sake of an expression of the unity of the church, the elders of one congregation lead their congregation into a relationship with others so that a denomination is formed. When that denomination is formed, that does not compromise the autonomy, the rule of that local congregation by their elders. They are autonomous from the others, and yet they join each other for the sake of the benefits that we see in our denomination, for example, in overseeing a seminary, in overseeing mission work, foreign and domestic. There's the benefits that one congregation can't do it by itself, so we do it with others together. But the local authority is always that of the elders. So now, let's detail this more specifically. We missed a point that we have to always highlight. And that's this. We must not think of the keys of the kingdom 
as a, a hard fist or a powerful sword. The power in the church is never physical. It's always spiritual. It's always the power of the Spirit to take the Word and work it. Work it in an understanding. Work it in a heart. The elders don't come with clenched fists. They come with folded hands. The elders don't come with a finger wagging in faces. They come with, this is what God says. This is how God would have us to live. This is how God would have us to believe. Don't believe me, believe this. And as they do that, they pray. Holy Spirit, I can't put it in anyone's understanding, and I can't certainly put it in anyone's heart. So just as parents, set before their children the word, in one way or another, always praying, so it becomes not militaristic, though its nature is that we call it the church militant. That's the church on earth because of the nature of the attack of Satan and the world. But the power is not of the men, but the power is of Christ. Jesus holds the keys. We always, in all of our thinking, not focus on the office of elder, but focus on Christ. He is truly the king of the church, the head of the body, but the king of the church. And Jesus himself is described as this. In fact, this is what he says of himself in Revelation 1, verse 18. I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. The grave and death. In Revelation 3, to the church at Philadelphia. Jesus says of himself, this is how he introduces the letter, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Jesus holds the key. The elders and the preacher do not. Christ does. That's where it originates, always. And why is it that when he shuts, no man can open, and when he opens, no man can shut? One, because he knows exactly every single one whom the Father gave to him in election. He knows them all. Two, when he died, suffered and died, he knew for whom he was dying and suffering. And he knows who, to whom he sends his spirit to call effectively, efficiently, so that whom he did predestinate them, he also called. And whom he called them, he also justified. Jesus does the calling. So Ephesus, once again, 
that verse 4, verse 20. Jesus never appeared there, but, Peter, but Paul writes to them, you were taught of Christ. You heard him. So it's that miracle of the work of the Holy Spirit when through the faithful <coughs> preaching of the gospel, the sheep hear, hear the voice of Christ, the shepherd. And they hear him admonish them. And then just like we read this morning at Pentecost, they're pricked by his voice. They hear his call and it has a touch to their heart and it turns them and then they are turned. The same thing is taught us when Jesus in John 10, when he talks about himself as the good shepherd and, the peop and his people being the sheep, he starts out in John 10 by saying, I am the door of the sheepfold. <coughs> now, in Matthew 18, you remember, in Matthew 16, rather, when Peter made that confession, then Jesus said to Peter, on the basis of this rock, this confession, I will build my church, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the key holder. Jesus is in heaven at God's right hand. Jesus dispensed the exercise of that key to the apostles. And the apostles transferred that same authority that Jesus gave to them, transferred it to the elders that they appointed in every church. Now, let's prove that. One is the very name presbyter or overseer or bishop indicates they hold the keys, they've been given it. That 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 tells the elders to admonish that sinner in the church at Corinth implies that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Why all this admonishing? Well, that should be obvious. We don't want to say, I'm sorry. We don't want to repent. Our natures, that nature against which we have to struggle all our life long, doesn't want to admit it. And so we need to be helped, we need to be aided, we need to be encouraged. So the nature of the preaching at times is that it admonishes us to repent. The authority is, of the elders is also evidenced in that here, verse, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 12, then add 13. There's an honor that God calls us to give to the office of elders, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. The passage that we read earlier out of Hebrews 13, obey them that have the rule over you, and they watch for your souls as they which must give an account. All of these ideas show Christ holds the keys. He doesn't let go of them, but he exercises that key through the office of, of apostle and then now in our day to the elders. Let's repeat and emphasize. The power of the keys is spiritual. They have God's promise Elders do, that Christ will work through them when they teach, maintain, and enforce the Scriptures. God alone forgives. God alone condemns. But that's the power of those thoughts in both Matthew 16 and again in Matthew 18. 
in Matthew 16, it went on, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And then do you remember how it ended? Whatsoever you bind on earth, you bind a sin to the sinner, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose to forgive, separate from the sinner, shall be loosed in heaven. That's Matthew 16, verse 19. Matthew 18, same idea. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind, tell the church. The form for elders says, when it says tell the church, it doesn't mean tell everybody. It tells though, but tell those that God is appointed in the church. And then again, verse 18 of 18, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The same thing in John 20, when Jesus made an appearance to the disciples, then he breathed on them the Holy Spirit and said this. Well, let me start at the beginning. Verse 20, 21, Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. That was the apostles. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. How many times does the Bible say this? How many times does Jesus say it? That's an authority that God gives to the office of elder in his church. How? The catechism shows us. They just preach. Yes, this is preaching. When the elders come with an open Bible, with a word and a passage that's related to what they are setting themselves before, someone whose beliefs or walk are contrary to the word, then they set before them two things. One, beloved. No. But immediately they say, and when you turn, we can assure you, forgiven, forgiven, received. Loosed. One other thing about Matthew 18. We often take the expression where one or two are gathered together in his name. Jesus will be in the midst of them and we apply that to ourselves. That's not correct. That is not correct. In Matthew 18, then verse 18 I read. Now listen to what follows. Again I say unto you, and he's talking to the church, the elders, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask in the form of work and discipline, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I grieve and I publicly confess right now that there have been times in the course of my ministry when the consistory has gotten to a point that there's a motion. And the motion is of one of the steps of discipline. That we've not done this in my name. Brothers, before we vote, we pray to him who alone is able. It's not our, our vote by majority or unanimous that does it. It's Christ. And if we're going to do this in his name, we better do it in his name and with his authority.
where two or three are gathered together in my name as elders, I am in the midst of them. That's why what's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What's bound on earth is bound in heaven. Faithful preaching and teaching declares the life and the sets of beliefs that must be followed. And with it always calls follow, follow, follow. Hear the voice of the shepherd. And if you don't, you're warned. Those words of Christ, or of John the Baptist, rather, at the end of John 3, powerful, powerful words. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's as simple as that. Why keys? Well, the necessity arises out of our natures. But why holy life? Why right believing? And the answer of the scriptures throughout is this. Because we're dealing with the glory of God and of Jesus Christ. The way we live, we who profess to be Christians, not just because we're here on a Sunday, But because all of our life, we live and strive to live that way. And again, a lot of that right way of living is that we say, I am sorry, forgive me, I didn't say that right. That that's to the glory of God. This morning... We're given to be filled with the Spirit. What does that enable us to do? To speak of the wonderful works of God. To say what he's done for me. That's glorifying God. Titus says, otherwise, no, by doing that, you adorn the teaching. You adorn it. The real value of a a woman is not in the plating of her hair. But she knows that she can adorn herself when her hair and her jewelry adorns her. We adorn the truth. We adorn the truth of God. When by our life, then men will behold your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is also for the well-being of the church. 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 5 admonished the elders to do something that they weren't doing. They weren't disciplining an obvious sin. He warns it this way, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He used that example, that figure of speech. You put a little bit of yeast, but then it works its way through the whole loaf. And so the whole loaf rises, not just a part of it. So in the church, to hold to the truth and to hold to the correct life, godliness, is so important for the well-being of the church. But then thirdly, it's for the salvation and the spiritual well-being of every believer. We are separated, we are loosed from our sins 
by repenting. The church at Pergamos and the church at Thyatira let sin go. God admonished them to do it, to discipline. But discipline because you love them. Never get to the point where you hate. Never may you allow yourselves to get to. And that's human nature. And always the elders have to work to love. Why, why do we go to someone who has sinned, according to Matthew 18? It's not so we can forgive them. It's because we care for their soul and their spiritual well-being. That's why we're praying for them, and we back it up with a word of admonition and love. Humility. So salvation is always proclaimed to the contrite, to the confessing, to the repenting. Even the worst, the hardest, the grossest sinners can may be told you're forgiven in the way of that repentance and confession. So the church is in the world. The keys must be there and they must be used. Pray for the elders. Pray for your elders. Always pray for them. And it's beautiful to hear the reassurances at different times in family visitation that they are. But here's a reminder. They didn't, they didn't put themselves into office. Christ used our votes, but Christ put them there. They don't get paid one penny for all the hours that they labor for the cause of the kingdom. Pray for them that they may do their work in a Christ-like manner with the scriptures and pray it's communicated and empowered by the Spirit. Amen. Lord our God, we pray thy blessing on our congregation that thou will bless and equip our elders. Encourage them, uphold them, bless them, that as they open thy word, thou wilt use everything they say to be something that thou wilt have them in need to hear for themselves. And bless the meeting of Synod where an equal number of elders are there with the ministers. Together, we thank thee for them. For Jesus' sake, amen.